Hello comrades, I'm currently in the process of editing my response to the libertarian socialist rants to his red bureaucracy video. Um, it's a highly requested thing, people have been asking me to do it. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna make a full commentary on his video, but because it's probably gonna be kinda long, uh, I'm going to make a series uh, addressing a couple of anarchist arguments that were brought up or somehow came up during that. So I'm going to be making a couple of videos on individual anarchist arguments. Some of those arguments, there's why didn't the Soviet Union and other Marxist-Leninist countries, why didn't they achieve stateless communism? That's going to be one. And also I'm going to be making uh, two videos on actually existing anarchism. This one is going to be on Magnavist Ukraine and the next one is going to be on CNT Catalonia. And I'm going to talk about how those uh, systems and those societies were actually organized and if they actually were stateless communism as anarchists claim. Yeah, uh, newsflash, they weren't, uh, but uh, I'll get into the details uh, in a moment. So, first of all, um, the historical relevance of anarchism. It is relatively slight. I mean, let's be honest. Anarchism was never a system that posed a significant threat to capitalism or any other system. It didn't uh, in any way rival the capitalist system or show any real promise that it would spread to uh, all the countries of the world. While... Um, the Soviet Union and the socialist countries and the socialist camp emerged as a force that threatened world capitalism and uh, and was um, almost as powerful as the capitalist camp, despite their inadvantageous uh, starting positions, because the socialist countries uh, began as uh, poor third world and colonial countries, while the capitalist countries were always rich imperialist countries. So, basically, anarchists have a, only a couple of things that they can show in terms of... Uh, you know, actually existing anarchism, which is still better than Trotskyist, because there's never been a Trotskyist revolution or a Trotskyist state, but, you know, I would say that Trotskyism is more irrelevant than anarchism. But anyway, um, basically, there hasn't really been an anarchist revolution where the anarchists have just said that, uh, let's have a revolution, and then the revolution has started and they've won. That hasn't really ever happened. Um, anarchists have managed to gain control of small territories in the course of um, other revolutions or other wars. So in Ukraine, when the October Revolution happened, that caused basically the Russian state to collapse and the anarchists in Ukraine seized control of, um, of a territory. But that was only possible because of the Bolsheviks. Similarly, in uh, Catalonia, which is a small territory in Spain, you know, Spain is not a very big country, but Catalonia is only a very small portion of Spain. But basically, when uh, when Franco had his fascist coup, it sparked a civil war between the Republic of Spain and its supporters and uh, the fascists. The fascists were backed by Nazi Germany and, uh, and fascist Italy, while the Republic was backed by the Soviet Union and uh, volunteers from other countries. There was a bigger concentration of anarchists in Catalonia, so they, they um, managed to take control of that area. But again, that wouldn't have happened uh, without the destabilization caused by the already existing civil war between sides that were much bigger than the anarchists. The anarchists were not a major player in Spain or in the Spanish civil war. The major players were the republican side and the fascist side. Anarchists were just a very small, minor faction in that. The anarchists, usually, they will overestimate their own importance in this, just like they overestimate tremendously their importance in the Russian Civil War, which was pretty much negligible. Now let's move more to the topic of actually existing anarchism. So, anarchists attacked the Soviet Union for not creating a stateless society. That I will talk about in a different video. But this uh, this argument only makes sense if we accept that anarchists themselves have created a stateless society. Which a lot of people just give them that. Um, a lot of people just accept the anarchist premise that the anarchists have themselves created a stateless society. And they will they will respond to that by saying, yeah, the anarchists created a stateless society, maybe, but what does it matter because the anarchists always lose? Which is certainly a valid argument. Um, the anarchists have never been able to 
hold power for a prolonged period of time, no matter what. Now, let's be perfectly honest, they've always had their problems with the Soviet Union and with Marxists, but they've always also gotten massive aid from the Marxists. Magnus Black Army in Ukraine would never have stood a chance without the Red Army. The Red Army was engaging the front of the White Army, while Magno was essentially just carrying out partisan activity. Magno's army could never have actually engaged the White Front the way the Red Army did during the course of the um, Civil War. That is often overshadowed by the fact that the unstable alliance between the Bolsheviks and the anarchists eventually broke down. Similarly, in the Spanish Civil War, the anarchists got massive material aid and other kinds of aid from the Soviet Union, which was the only country that um, chose to help the Republican side, anarchist or otherwise. And the anarchists often attacked the Soviet Union for stopping to send money and weapons to the anarchists. But I would just point out that if you guys are so awesome, then why do you need us to give you money and weapons all the time? Why don't you do something yourselves? And mo most importantly, the anarchists, they could have never stood a chance against um, the fascists. In fact, they never won a battle. They always lost. They never had a decisive victory or even... They never really had any kind of victory in the civil war. And if the Soviet-backed Republican force had not taken the brunt of the fascist attack, the anarchists would have crumbled immediately. Now, what about actually existing anarchism? Well, the anarchists in Catalonia and in the Ukrainian territory created their own society, uh, shall we say. And uh, they often claim that this represents stateless communism, but in my opinion, especially in the case of Ukraine, this is laughable, because in Ukraine, there was no communism, there wasn't even socialism. Um, most people, the vast majority of people, millions, were semi-feudal peasant farmers, small peasant farmers. Um, in many ways, it wasn't, uh, it was semi-feudal, it was pre-capitalist. Uh, most people farmed food for themselves and then they ate it. There wasn't even massive marketing of food. Mostly people just farmed for their own survival. And then, then there were other people who uh, produced a bit more and they managed to sell it. That was mostly what was going on. Um, then there was, of course, a small industry as well in the towns. Now, the anarchists had their biggest uh, strongholds in the rural areas. And they were actually pretty anti-urban, uh, interestingly enough. Now, there were some communes, but the communes, which were more or less just experimental things, um, it wasn't a massive nationwide campaign of establishing communes. Instead, it was just a small experiment of setting one commune here. When it failed, they would set up another commune there, try it out. It never really worked out, and uh, less than 1% of the population were actually in any way involved in these communes. So, let's face it, there was no socialist economy in this uh, anarchist territory. Also, I would totally question its statelessness. In my opinion, it is totally undeniable that the anarchists in Ukraine actually created their own state. If you're interested to know why Marxists argue that the state cannot be abolished, it uh, can only wither away once the conditions for its withering away have been created, then uh, check out my video on the withering away of the state. But basically the gist of it is this. The state is an instrument of class struggle which arises when there is massive class conflict. So basically when there is a proletariat that is trying to suppress a bourgeois counter-revolution, they will create a state in the form of their own military or militias, their own um, police force and all that stuff, their own legislature that serves the proletarian interest and their own uh, economic systems. Now, the opposite of that would be the bourgeois state, which is, of course, the bourgeois police force and the bourgeois military and the bourgeois legislature, the entire goal of which is to basically stop the poor from taking what they need from the rich. So as long as this kind of massive conflict between these two opposing groups, proletarians and capitalists, exists, then the state is going to be there, it cannot be gotten rid of. Which is why the anarchists also created a state, even though they of course didn't call it a state. Um, in Ukraine they called it the 
Regional Military Revolutionary Council of Peasants, Workers and Insurgents, or simply the Regional Military Council. Now, that is very sneaky. I mean, the big thing about anarchists is that they like to redefine things. You know, when they set up a state, they don't call it a state, they, they call it a Regional Military Council. Ooh. You know, the libertarian socialist Rance, he uh, defined a state as being something that has a monopoly on legitimate use of violence and a particular territory, and the regional, um, as in territorial, military revolutionary council, as in, you know, the thing that controls all the guns, that the Magnavis had uh, certainly would fit that definition perfectly. Now, why do the anarchists even claim that the Magnavis state wasn't a state? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. I mean, there's... The only thing that I can think of is because anarchists say they are not statists. Magno insisted that what he created was not a state, but that's pretty much all that there is. There is no real evidence to support this, because this regional council certainly had all the elements of a state. Uh, it was a ruling body of this area with uh, authority that couldn't be questioned. Um, all other parties were illegal. All other newspapers, except the anarchist newspaper, were illegal. Um, the military council had a total monopoly on violence. They had their own secret police, which was called the Contra Zvedka. They had their own um, penal system. You know, everyone knows about Magno chain-ganging peasants who opposed his rule and using them as slave labor. But even if you don't accept that Magno had a state, if I was an anarchist, I wouldn't support Magno. I mean, I know plenty of anarchists who don't support Magno, but I also know plenty who do. But you really shouldn't, because he was an awful guy. I mean, his concept of anarchy meant that they just, they destroyed the bourgeois state where they found it, and they pretty much just acted like bandits. They went from village to village, um, taking what they need, um, they just stole people's stuff with no compensation of any kind. At least the Bolsheviks, when they procured grain from the, from the peasants, they paid them at a fixed price, or they gave them certificates which were basically war bonds, ensuring people that uh, when the Bolsheviks win, they will pay them, which is what, you know, that's what war bonds are. But the anarchists, they just, they stole people's stuff, and that's that. Now, sometimes anarchists will say that the Magnavist army was a, was not a typical army, well, the Magnavist army was a totally typical army. The Bolsheviks adopted a policy of conscription because the whites also had conscription and because the Bolsheviks thought that they needed to do that. So that's why Magno also um, adopted the same policy. But because he was an anarchist, he didn't want to call it conscription because that doesn't sound very stateless. You know, because what is conscription? Conscription is when the state tells you that you need to fight in the military and you have no choice in the matter. That is conscription. It's a, it's a draft. Now, the anarchists, they couldn't have that, so instead they called it voluntary mobilization instead of conscription. Now, it has the term voluntary in the name, right? So you would think that it would be voluntary, as in you don't have to go unless you want to, right? As in, you know, you know what, you all know what voluntary means. But no, this is a bulletin that the Magnavis state issued, and it says, quote, Some groups have understood voluntary mobilization as as mobilization only for those who wish to enter the insurrectionary army, and that anyone f who for any reason wishes to stay at home is not liable. This is not correct. The voluntary mobilization has been called because the peasants, workers and insurgents themselves decided to mobilize themselves without awaiting the arrival of instructions from the central authority. Hmm. Now, doesn't that sound like an incredible pile of horseshit? Like, what the fuck does that mean? So they say, voluntary mobilization is not voluntary. In fact, you have no choice. You have to come. You know, you thought that that means that you can stay at home if you want to. But that is not correct. It's not correct. You have to come and join the army. And the justification <laughs> is that the voluntary mobilization has been called, in other words, the conscription and the draft has been called because some peasants and some workers already uh, mobilized before. So because there's some people who volunteered, that means that everyone has to volunteer. Now that's, that's of course total bullshit. It implies that everyone is already mobilizing, so uh, we're just making this policy to make it official even though everyone's already mobilizing. Now that is of course total bullshit. The actual reason why they implemented this policy is because not enough people chose to volunteer. That is the, like, that is the obvious explanation. Why do they need to issue this voluntary conscription where everyone is forced to come? It's because they were running out of soldiers.
then uh, there's of course the idea that Magno's army was somehow special kind of army because it uh, had no normal military discipline or something like that. Well, that is not exactly the case either. This is what Magno says on the subject. Quote, Without discipline inside the organization, there is no way of undertaking any consequential revolutionary activity at all. In the absence of discipline, the revolutionary vanguard cannot exist. So, it is pretty interesting that Magno considers himself a vanguardist, even though all anarchists oppose vanguardism. For in that case, it would find itself in utter disarray and its practice would be incapable of identifying the tasks that the movement are of living up to the initiator role that the masses expect of it. So Magno wasn't opposed to military discipline either in its most traditional sense. Now, Magno's Black Army of course had the unusual feature that, theoretically, the soldiers could elect their own uh, officers, but in practice that wasn't really carried out. In fact, Magno had total veto powers on who was elected, not to mention that there was basically massive nepotism going on, like he, his government consisted of his wife and his buddies, so yeah, there's that, and he himself was undeniably pretty much a military dictator whose power was totally unrivaled and uncontested. Uh, you know, even Stalin didn't have uh, veto powers on all elections that happened. 